Let us again begin in prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Heavenly Father, in the gift of this day, in the gift of divine mercy, you show the full extent of your mercy, which is manifested in the mercy of the sacred heart of your Son, our Lord Jesus. We ask you to send the Holy Spirit that we will have a greater understanding of his mercy, the wisdom to receive his mercy, and the grace to become channels of his infinite mercy. We ask this through our Blessed Mother, she who is the Mediatrix of Mercy. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Saint Joseph, patron of the church, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. I want to begin by a reading from the diary of Saint Faustina that at first observation seems truly too good to be true. And yet it is the gift that each one of us can receive on this special day. These are the words of our Lord to Saint Faustina. My daughter, tell the whole world about my inconceivable mercy. I desire that the Feast of Mercy be a refuge and shelter for all souls, especially for poor sinners. On that day, the very depths of my tender mercy are open. I pour out a whole ocean of graces upon those who approach the font of my mercy. The soul that will go to confession and receive Holy Communion shall obtain complete forgiveness of sins and punishment. On that day, all the divine floodgates through which grace flow are opened. Let no soul fear to draw near to me. Even though its sins be as scarlet, my mercy is so great that no mind, be it of man or of angel, will be able to fathom it throughout all eternity. Everything that exists has come forth from the very depths of my most tender mercy. Every soul in its relation to me will I contemplate my love and mercy throughout eternity. The feast of mercy emerged from my very depths of tenderness. It is my desire that it be solemnly celebrated on the first Sunday after Easter. Mankind will not have peace until it turns to the font of my mercy. St. Thomas Aquinas tells us that God's greatest attribute is his mercy. And on this day, who of us would hesitate to receive holy confession, the sacrament of reconciliation and penance, and then receive holy, community, uh, holy communion to be returned to a level of baptismal purity. It sounds too good to be true, and yet that is infinite mercy. Confession, communion, a return to baptismal purity. Now some of us may be tempted to say, this is good for everyone else, this is understandable, except for me except for me because of the sins of my past. The rest of the people here, the rest of the people have had a life of grace and faith, but my sins are so extraordinary. My past is so dark. My mistakes so ubiquitous. Jesus has this to say for you. If you're hearing this promise, you're hearing this gift, but your response is, not in my case. This is also from the diary, the words of Jesus to a soul. He says, my mercy is greater than your sins and those of the entire world. Who can measure the extent of my goodness? 
For you I descended from heaven to earth. For you I allowed myself to be nailed to the cross. For you I let my sacred heart be pierced with a lance, thus opening wide the source of mercy for you. Come then with trust to draw graces from this fountain. I never reject a contrite sinner and a contrite heart. Your misery has disappeared in the depths of my mercy. Do not argue with me about your wretchedness. You will give me pleasure if you hand over to me all your troubles and grief. I shall heap upon you the treasures of my grace. Child, speak no more of your misery. It is already forgotten. Listen, my child, to what I desire to tell you. Come close to my wounds and draw from the fountain of life whatever your heart desires. Drink copiously from the fountain of life and you will not weary on your journey. Look at the splendors of my mercy and do not fear the enemies of your salvation. Glorify my mercy. Picture a father and a son. Being the father of three sons, uh, there's something about the male gender that likes to block things up, uh, who likes to make dams, who likes to stop water flows. I can't explain this, perhaps it's original sin or it's just the male characteristic. But if you're with a child, if you're with a son and there's a water flow, there's always the desire to set a little dam. And so picture a father with a very small child, some four or five years old, next to a huge waterfall. And the waters are cascading over the mountain and there's the roar of the power of the waters. But the little four-year-old boy says, look, Daddy, I'm going to dam up this great fall. And he takes a little stick, and he puts the stick on the very side of this roaring water. And he's somewhat disappointed when he sees his stick go right off the side. So he gets another stick, maybe a little bit bigger. And he says, Daddy, I'm going to stop this water. And the father says, you can't stop the water, son, but go ahead and try. So the son puts the larger stick down, and once again the water flows over. And a third time, the little four-year-old gets the biggest stick he can drag over, a little piece of branch from a nearby tree. And he again says, I'm going to stop the flow. And the father just smiles. And he puts that larger stump that he pulls over in the water and almost immediately it's lost. It's over the edge of this great fall. My friends, sometimes we are that child. Sometimes we think that through our sins we can stop an infinite waterfall of grace. And we think, but you don't know my sins. You don't know how much I've done wrong. People don't understand me. They don't understand the real me. And Jesus responds, I do. I read your soul. I know your sins. And you have no more ability of stopping my waterfall of mercy any more than a four-year-old child with a stick. You don't have the ontological being to stop the infinite flow of the graces of our Lord. That's what this day represents. It's a day of infinite mercy. We only have to put our sins into this waterfall through the sacrament of confession, and they're gone. So it's a day of infinite power in the mercy of our Lord Jesus. Now, we also see in the diary of Faustina a great connection between the two great movements of our age. The first movement is the triumph of divine mercy the time of the forgiveness of sins. Because the triumph of divine mercy is a continuation of devotion to the sacred heart of Jesus. But it's brought powerfully to the present moment for our sins and for our age. And the second great movement is the triumph of the immaculate heart of Mary. And they are really two aspects of one movement. Why? 
because it's a seeking of mercy and peace. Mercy and peace. The mercy of the heart of Jesus and the peace that can only come into the world through the Immaculate Heart of Mary. And John Paul II, in his encyclical on the Blessed Mother, Redemptoris Mater, Mother of the Redeemer, gave us a title for our Blessed Mother that unites these two movements, divine mercy and the triumph of the Immaculate Heart of Mary. He called the Blessed Mother the Mediatrix of Mercy, especially in preparation for a second coming of Jesus Christ. Powerful words from John Paul the Great. Now let's go to the messages of the Divine Mercy and the message of Fatima and the Triumph of the Immaculate Heart. And we're going to see a very profound similarity. In 1916, an angel came to the children of Fatima. And the angel of Portugal taught the children a prayer to do Eucharistic reparation for the sins of mankind because God is much offended. Now imagine if he's much offended in 1916, how much offended is he in 2009? And how much more do we have to continue with these prayers of Eucharistic reparation? These are the prayers that the angel of Portugal taught the Fatima children. Quote, Most Holy Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, I offer you the most precious body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus Christ, present in all the tabernacles of the world, in reparation for the outrages, sacrileges, and indifferences with which he himself is offended. And through the infinite merits of his most sacred heart and the immaculate heart of Mary, I beg of you conversion of poor sinners. When I was a young child, I would go into church and I would see typically elderly women with their heads prostrate to the ground in front of the Blessed Sacrament, praying these prayers. And I was wondering as a child, why are they doing this and, and what are they doing? And then my mother let me know that yeah, they're praying the prayers of Fatima in reparation with their heads down. Why? Because that's an ultimate position of prostration and reverence before our Eucharistic Jesus. Heads down. We're so concerned today about what's the proper posture at various liturgy and masses. Well, if you want to do it the way the angels do it, we'd all have our heads prostrate in the presence of our Eucharistic Jesus. A few years later, Jesus comes to Faustina and gives her this prayer, which we know now as part of the chaplet. Eternal Father, I offer you the body and blood, soul and divinity of your dearly beloved Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, in atonement for the sins and those of the whole world. Notice the remarkable similarity of these prayers. But what's behind them? Why would the angel of Portugal, why would the Fatima message call for Eucharistic reparation? And why would the message of divine mercy call for the same element? Well, picture the world from the view of the Heavenly Father. The Heavenly Father looks down and he sees the world. And sadly, tragically, he sees great darkness. And in the midst of the darkness of human rejection, of atheism, of communism, of moral compromise, of the rejection of God, of the rejection of the Holy Father, of the rejection of the moral teachings of the church, which are only there to protect us and to protect our families and protect our children. He sees great darkness out of these rejections. But in this darkness, over on this side, he sees a ray of light. And it's a powerful ray of light, but it's an individual ray of light. So light comes up here. And over here, he sees another ray of light. And then here, another ray of light. So that through the darkness, there's these little rays of light. What are those rays? That's every time the priest offers the sacrifice of the Mass. Because, my friends, the sacrifice of the Mass is the priest in the place of Jesus saying, Heavenly Father, in light of the sufferings of Jesus, in light of his precious blood, do not respond to us in justice, respond to us in mercy. And that's what the Father prefers. But remember, justice is a true attribute. Justice is a true virtue. And so the Father prefers to respond to us in mercy, but without those rays of light, without the offering of the sacrifice of the Mass, he must respond in justice. So as he looks out and sees 
the darkness, and he sees priests offering the sacrifice of the Mass, offering Jesus to the Father, which is the means by which we have mercy, he sees that the 20th century and the 21st century will have even greater darkness. And therefore, sadly, the 20th century and 21st century perhaps will have even less priests. And so he calls on the laity. He calls on you and me in virtue of our baptism to commence a process, a powerful, mystical, profound process of offering Jesus in the Eucharist, already consecrated, for the same goal, for mercy. And so what happens in the prayers of Fatima, and what happens when you pray the chaplet of divine mercy? What you're doing is you're offering the Eucharistic Jesus present in all the tabernacles of the world back to the Father so that you're adding to the light. Now it's not as powerful as the priestly sacrifice. We know that. And it presupposes the priestly sacrifice because we have to have Eucharist to offer. We can't consecrate. Only our beloved priests can consecrate. But once the Eucharist is consecrated, then it's up to us to offer Jesus and Eucharist back to the Father so more light comes up to him. More of the darkness dissipates. And the greatest thing we can offer is our Eucharistic Jesus. That's why at Fatima and in Divine Mercy, we have this prayer. We're offering the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus present in all the tabernacles of the world back to the Father so he can respond in mercy, which is his preference. And so do we see the power of the Eucharist? Secondly, do we see the power of the priesthood? You know, there's, in, 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 certainly in the West, and I don't know the situation here, but there's been a lot of discussion, a lot of press about the difficulties of priesthood, about certain failings of a tiny percentage of priests. My friends, we must always thank God for the gift of holy priesthood. We must always thank our priests for the gift of themselves. We must not look at the 1.5% of difficulty, we must rejoice and thank God for the almost 99% of faithful, holy priests that give us baptism, that give us Eucharist, that forgive us our sins, that become channels of mercy for us, that anoint us, that bury our dead. That's the power of priesthood. We must always praise priesthood. We must always thank God for priesthood. And secondly, we must do our part to offer in virtue of the priesthood of the laity, to offer Jesus back to the Father so he can have mercy. And this is our time. This is the power of the feast of mercy. And there's another dimension where we see the power of mercy, and that is, of course, with our Blessed Mother. We spoke about at length yesterday the call for a proclamation, for a solemn papal definition of the true doctrine that Mary is the spiritual mother of all peoples, the co-redemptrix, the mediatrix, and advocate. It is already a teaching of the church, but when the Holy Father, who has the keys of the kingdom of God, when he solemnly proclaims this truth to the world, then what happens to us personally when we consecrate ourselves to our Blessed Mother, and what happens to us personally when we do things like today, when we, when we experience the mercy of Divine Mercy Sunday, what happens to us personally will become global. It will become historic. It will become universal. And that's why the proclamation has to be public, universal, by the Vicar of Christ on Earth. We know the peace we feel today when we do the Divine Mercy gift of confession and communion, but the world is not receiving that. Much of the world is still in darkness. And we know the blessing and the protection we feel with the Blessed Mother when we consecrate ourselves to her Immaculate Heart. But the world is not experienced that universally. That's why we need a triumph of divine mercy. That's why we need a proclamation of the dogma of Mary, co-redemptrix, mediatrix, and advocate, because she is the mediatrix of mercy. And that's why we have to cooperate with these graces. Heaven is at our disposal. Heaven is being so generous, but we have to respond. Well, there is another manifestation of divine mercy today that is also very powerful. And I was happy to hear that in my conversations with a few people uh, yesterday that they're familiar with a spiritual movement 
that has been really spreading throughout the world like wildfire. It is called the Lay Apostles of Jesus Christ, the Returning King. It has the full permission of the local bishop. This is a bishop in Ireland, Bishop Leo O'Reilly of Ireland, of the Kilmore Diocese, who went to the Congregation for the Doctrine of Faith and submitted all these messages and this movement. And the Congregation for the Doctrine of Faith, the Vatican's doctoral commission, told him, continue as you are doing now. Because through this woman, she is a mother of six, her name is Anne, she's referred to as Anne Lay Apostle, and messages from Jesus through his Eucharistic heart, we have another manifestation of divine mercy for our time, another powerful source of healing, of grace, and of victory. What is the heart of this continuity of divine mercy for our day, this, this movement of Jesus Christ, the returning king? Well, I want to read to you again from Faustina's diary when she says very clearly that this time of mercy will be followed by a time of justice, by a time when we will, in fact, see a certain manifestation of Jesus in our era. These are the words of Faustina. She says, quote, Then I saw the mother of God, who said to me, Oh, how pleasing to God is the soul that follows faithfully the inspirations of his grace. I gave the Savior to the world. As for you, you have to speak to the world about his great mercy and prepare the world for the second coming of him who will come not as merciful Savior, but as the just judge. Oh, how terrible is this day. Determined is the day of justice, the day of divine wrath. The angels tremble before it. Speak to souls, therefore, about this great mercy while it is still the time for granting mercy. If you keep silent now, you will be answering for a great number of souls on that terrible day. Fear nothing. Be faithful to the end. So Faustina, Saint Faustina, talks about a manifestation of Jesus, some type of visible manifestation. This again is, a, is an act of mercy that for those who doubt Jesus is true, Jesus is real, Jesus is the divine savior, and Jesus is mercy. In the spiritual movement of Jesus Christ, the returning king, you have a similar theme. And I want to read to you from this volume two, and I want to mention that the Miriam Ministries here, Miriam Media, uh, will be taking any signups for people who want to get a copy of this volume two. This copy is called uh, conversations with the Eucharistic Heart of Jesus. I want to emphasize again, this has the full permission of her local bishop. She's a mother of six, American-born, living in Ireland, and this is already in 15 different languages and is now being translated into Mandarin and having a profound effect in communist China as we speak. Uh, I want to read to you, and again, it's available through Miriam uh, Media. Uh, there's a sign-up in the back for those who are interested. I want to read to you how profoundly Eucharistic is this return of a rescue mission for souls, that it's time that Jesus would be more manifest and more generous in calling people back to him. And he says, and I quote, my children, I am speaking to you from the depth of my Eucharistic heart. My dearest little souls of this world, you must come back to me. I want your love now as never before, and I want to protect you as never before. Because our time is not like your time, I can communicate with you in a timeless manner. This is what I wish to tell you. I am going to share my deepest secrets with you. I am going to remove the veil from the tabernacle as never before. I want you to know me. I want you to know me in my miraculous form of the consecrated host. I am the bread of life. Yes, and I am your Jesus also. I was a humble man who walked your paths of difficulty, want, and hardship. Many treated me badly, so I understand the pain of hurt. We had little money, so I understand the pain of hunger. I was different so I understand the pain of isolation. Little ones, I am with you. 
I want to teach you things that souls of past times did not learn until they came to heaven. I am doing this because I am rising up a tidal wave of Christians to wash over the shore of badness that has taken control of this world so lovingly cre created by my Father. This process will cleanse your world, making it safe once again for God's children. I am going to bring you knowledge, wisdom, and love. I am going to introduce you to the divine to make your hearts burn like furnaces of divine love. You will be given the opportunity to work with me. Children, come with me now. Walk this walk of the divine with me, your Savior. Together we will call out to others to join us. In this way, we rise up against evil and reclaim goodness for the world, for its people, and for God in heaven. I am omnipotent. By cooperating with me and working with me, you share in my power. You will learn to love in a way that have never been known before. I am revealing myself in a new way, such as I have never done. Come, let us together pay homage and pledge obedience to God the Father. It is he who decrees this work. Thank him often and deeply for these graces, for with these graces you will help me to save the world. I want to show my children the great devotion I have for them. I reside in tabernacles all over the world. I do this because I desire my children to have a living Christ in their midst. Such holiness is available to souls who visit and venerate me in the Eucharist. I am the cure for every ill. I am the calm for every storm. I am the comfort for every sorrow. Because I intend to lead my children in a more enhanced way, I am going to show you the life that is enclosed in each tabernacle. My dear ones, if you but knew the value of each and every visit that is made to me here in the tabernacle, there would be crowds all throughout every day and every night. It is this crowd of souls I invite now. So the Eucharistic Jesus is saying to a world that is in great pain, if you feel a cross right now that you feel is almost unbearable, or perhaps for some you feel it is unbearable, this message is for you. Jesus is saying, Perhaps your cross is unbearable without me, but I am here. I am here in the Eucharist, and every single ailment, every single difficulty, every question, every act of confusion that we suffer from, all of that is solved before our Eucharistic Jesus. There was one spiritual director in Italy who uh, was well known, and people came to him from all over the world for their crises and their spiritual difficulties. For every single person, he had the same remedy. Spend one hour before our Eucharistic Jesus every day. And do so for at least a year. And all of them responded that every grace and healing, especially healings of the hearts and the desires, was taking place by our Eucharistic Jesus. I had the opportunity, the, the, the privilege of, of being with uh, Mother Teresa for a series of days, and we were riding in a little car through India and through Calcutta, and uh, actually we were stopped because a couple of the cows were in the middle of the road, and we were stopping as the cows were proceeding. And I thought, I've got this living saint right next to me. Surely there's something I can ask her. And I turned to her, I said, Mother, what would it take to stop abortion in the United States? Mother did not pause for a moment. She said, if every parish gave three hours of Eucharistic adoration each day, abortion would be entirely eliminated in the United States. That's the power of our Eucharistic Jesus. And the power and the needs are something we have to tap through our cooperation. I want to read a second excerpt on how Jesus in these messages say he's present to each one of us. I think it's fair to say that there is loneliness, there's temptations through despair, there's a, a difficulty because of family breakdown, because of breakdown of spouses, because of breakdown of society. People have never felt so lost and so lonely. Jesus in this message tells us how he is there for each one of us in a powerful way. 
He says, and I quote, My children, I am with you. You have heard me say that many times before. Perhaps I have said it so often that you do not really hear it. Today, I want you to both hear these words and understand them. I am with you. Does this mean I watch you from heaven, hoping all goes well? Does it mean I gaze out over my whole world, seeing only the large events? No. I am with you. I am with you, my child. That means I see the world with your eyes. I walk your walks, and I experience what you experience. I am there when you are hurt. I feel the sting of human unkindness when you experience it. I feel the weakness and pain in your body when you are sick. My compassionate gaze, so filled with love and understanding, rests upon you every minute of every day. I forgive you any sins even before these sins are committed. But you must admit to your sins and ask forgiveness. My child, do you think you have been abandoned? I say with divine solemnity, I am with you. So begin to focus on the fact that every minute of every day, your Jesus is present. Talk to me, dear child. I have so much to tell you. I have the answers for your difficulties. I have explanations for things you do not understand. I have love for people that you do not feel. So if you focus on the reality of my presence, you will begin to rely on me. My child, then the transition can begin. Once you begin to rely on me, your life will get easier and less stressful. You will walk away from even the most difficult situations and leave them behind instead of carrying that worry with you into the next area of your life. You will find this to be so liberating that quite quickly it will become your habit. And then, child, it will be me working through you. And when that goal is reached, there is no limit to what we can do. Again, I say to you today, you must practice for something to become a habit. So today, concentrate, concentrate on my continual presence. Ask me what I should like you to do. Ask me what words I would like you to use. Then listen for my answer. My spirit will speak to you, and you will hear the words resting upon your soul. In this way, we can communicate all day long. Have faith. I give you faith today as you take these first steps to unity with me. There is no situation where you should leave me. Even in the most difficult of circumstances, call upon me. Even in sinful conditions, or should I say especially in sinful conditions, cry out to me. I am there anyway, my child. You cannot hide your sin by ignoring me and hoping I have gone away. So speak to me. Say, Lord, help me. You will not be disappointed. I will help you. I will bring you these words today so that you may understand that I am with you. I will never leave you. I await your notice and stand by, ready to assure you that you are cherished by me and that I did not put you on earth to do work that was too hard for you. If your life is too hard, my little soul, it is because you are trying to accomplish it alone. You need me, and I am here for you. So let us waste no time. Jesus, your Jesus, is asking for your attention. Once I have your attention, we can proceed. You will never regret having returned to me. Do not hesitate. Come and sit before me in the tabernacle, and we will begin. So we hear the words of Jesus. My friends, some of the saints, even going back to Abraham, who God said, if you want to seek perfection, you're going to have to practice my continued presence. That means we're going to have to work on speaking to Jesus for the day, on acting like Jesus is right next to us, in understanding the spiritual doctrine of the church, that if you're in grace, Jesus dwells in your soul, as well as Abba Father and the Holy Spirit. You can't be alone. 
There's nowhere you can go where he will not be there if you're in the state of grace. But as he says, we have to practice that. St. Elizabeth of the Trinity, the great Carmelite sister at the beginning of the 20th century, thought of nothing else than the fact that she was a walking tabernacle of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. If you feel lonely, isolated, without the grace to live your vocation, remember, they are with you always. And Jesus is asking in this special time that we will focus more on his continual presence in our soul because you know what, my friends? We'll act differently. If we really understand that he's always with us, we will not do the things we know that displease him in the same way. It is a radical act of transformation when we take his words to heart and we have this continual presence. And finally, I want to read one message from our Blessed Mother because she, as the Mediatrix of Mercy, is the one that always refocuses us back to Jesus. She's the one who always, with a special maternal heart, understands our pains and focuses back to where our solutions are, which are always in the heart of Jesus. Our Lady says, and I quote, Dearest children, nestled in my immaculate heart, you must live your lives joyfully. Jesus, my beloved Son, has given you everything you need to become true servants. In order to have peace on this earth, you must serve him, who is all light, all goodness. I am his mother. I am also your mother. Call on me often, little children of this world. I have helped many souls reach heaven, and I will help you. Confide your fears to me, and I will console you. A motherly heart understands each weakness in her children and can help her children overcome habits that distract them from their union with God. Children, let me help you. Run to me when you fear you are not serving Jesus, and I will lead you straight back to his holy path, the path he has marked especially for you. We are near you always in everything. Truly, heaven and earth are joined as never before. Take full advantage of this. Heaven is happy, dearest children, because God is there. But you can be happy on earth also, because God is with you now. The more you seek him, the more he will reveal himself to you personally. All is well. We guard you and your loved ones without tiring. And you will see that your service to heaven brings you joy and more joy. Be with Jesus, my children. And so we are called in the fullness of divine mercy, in our responsibility to participate in the triumph of the Immaculate Heart, to cooperate in joy. And I want to conclude with this thought that's very strong in these messages. And again, if you're interested in getting copies of this, you can sign up and back with Miriam uh, Media and they will send out an order form. There's a series of volumes, they're small volumes, but they're powerful. There was one case in Ireland where a person with a very serious illness was cured just by the volume being touched to the body of the person. Uh, that's Jesus wanting these to spread with the same quickness for our good. But visualize as a last concept, 10 people. And on the faces of nine people, you see the reality of the world. You see discouragement. You see despair. You see isolation. You see hopelessness. But that tenth person, without saying a word, that tenth person has peace. That tenth person has joy. There's a smile in their face. There's a sparkle in their eye. And as they do speak to you, there's a joy, there's a, there's a happiness, there's a personal love for you, even though you've never met this person. That tenth person, my friends, has to be you and me. No matter how dark things get, no matter how difficult things get, we cannot control the world situation. We cannot control the stock market. We cannot control economic crises. In some cases, we can't even control what happens in our families. What we can control is our attitude of the heart which comes from our Lord and our Mother. We can be channels of mercy and peace, but we must be people of joy. We must become that tenth person, whether it's in the marketplace or at the workplace or helping the poor in the streets. 
where Jesus can be seen through us. We cannot do that on our own. We cannot be the source of joy on our own. We must be more generous in our Eucharistic prayer to our Jesus and to our prayers of rosary and consecration to our Blessed Mother. Let's take on the challenge to be icons of mercy and peace in an age without mercy and peace. And then we'll do our part to bring an era of peace to the world. Let's ask Our Lady, the Mediatrix of Mercy, for that grace as we pray. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. St. Joseph, patron of the triumph of the Immaculate Heart of Mary, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. I thank you and God bless you.